feel like uh, it's probably a good time to get started. Uh, 6.04. It's busy, uh, been a busy week, busy couple weeks, a lot of uh, amazing activities going on around the district, but it does uh, it does keep things busy for sure. And tonight I drove in until the parking lot full, and hopefully there are people here who think they're at the adult at graduation. I mean, because adult at graduation is down the hall, but this is the facilities uh, planning meeting, just to make sure you're all the right place. Uh, if you're not, you can take some action. Those aren't just for participants, but we do, we do have cookies, we have chips, pretzels, water, so definitely help yourself. Uh, so I am the Clay Lisa Superintendent uh, of the district, and it's just about 365 days into my first year. It feels like longer in some ways, but there we go. 60 years to go in the uh, and I think we're all ready for, for summer and a, and a, a reset. Uh, I don't know. So I, I'm very happy with the turnout. Thank you for coming. This is important work, right? Important stuff that we're talking about. And, and we had a few people at the last session, but I feel like the messaging that those folks brought was pretty powerful, and, and, and I think it represented a lot of different points of view, and hopefully um, you've had a chance. And if you have, we have a recording that being posted on our YouTube uh, site, and we are recording tonight also for folks who can't make it. So, so I think the goal tonight is, uh, again, folks from Garmin are gonna take us through a, a process. Uh, they're gonna take the information from the last meeting, that we shared, some of the work that we've done between meetings with some of the teams from district personnel. And then I think we're eventually going to get to even some sort of what ifs with a very little detail to them, but just some high level concepts of what things could look like for the district moving forward and how do we try to get all our needs met. Um, I've said many times that the one thing I feel most sure of is that doing nothing is potentially going to create a, a big problem for us and expense in itself, um, but I don't know what the answer is and what we should do. So, the good news is we passed the school budget. That is official. All the towns are certified. So, thank you for those of you who supported that. Um, so, that was the good news. So, I think at this point, I will turn it over to Lisa. From here. Thank you. Good evening. I see lots of familiar faces from the first forum. So, welcome back. And those who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, we are going to do a recap of the first forum. So, if you weren't there, we're going to catch you up to speed. And then we'll launch into the second forum. Um, but just really want to thank you folks. I know it's hard to get out and attend these in person. Um, so really just thank you for your time and participation because we can't do this without you guys. This is your community, these are your schools, this is your master plan. So we need your input for this to really be by the community. That said, I'm going to do a overview of the first um, Forum, and then I'm going to pass it over to um, one of our colleagues, Mike Crow, who's going to run us through the interactive portion of tonight. We are going to have you get up and move around. Um, we won't require any dances, but we will stop you if you want to. Um, but real quick, um, the agenda for tonight recap of forum number one. And then we're going to get into what if. This is the brainstorming session we did with the building committee. You're going to see the what ifs that we proposed, we just posed, and we got feedback from them. We'll go over what we heard from them, and then Mike will get us through an interactive engagement session with all of you so we can get your feedback. I want to preface this with these are truly just what ifs. We're still in data collection mode. We don't have the data to say, hey, we're leaning towards this option or that option. We are truly in data collection mode, and what this exercise in tonight will help us understand is just what you're thinking is. So that as we're going into this, we understand from the community perspective how you're thinking about these and things that we may not be able to think of because we're not part of the community. Um, so let's jump in. Community form number one recap. So we're in the same room, same whiteboard. Um, and we went over, um, uh, Superintendent Lisa and, and, and us spoke about um, what is a master plan, what are the project goals, an overview of the master planning process, and then we had a community discussion, and we wanted to hear from the community what steps do you think the district needs to take to achieve the project goals. And we had a really robust conversation, lots of participation. That is what you're seeing on the board here, is the outcome of what we were charged with that evening. And um, the goals. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, what is a master plan? So, a facilities master plan is when we assess and analyze the options to determine the most effective use of resources now and in the future. 
This is achieved through the items you see here on the um, slide. We want to identify the district goals. We're going to use the enrollment study, which is in process right now. It's going to show us what are the enrollment trends and where is it looking to be going, whether it's steady, up, down, what are we seeing? We're going to analyze the existing spaces and the utilization of your existing spaces, and we're in that process right now. Assessment of current and future educational visioning and programming. So we've had a lot of visioning sessions, a lot of educational visioning sessions with different um, teachers and leaders throughout the districts to really understand what is the educational vision. We sat down with our principal and we understood what is happening in our schools, what maybe space is inadequate, what is missing, and ultimately it's going to be a long-term facility solution that addresses these goals and again the most efficient use of your resources. So the goals that have come out of this process so far are a combination of goals we've heard from the building committee as well as the visioning sessions and they're captured here. Um, one of the things we hear over and over is the term the most effective use of resources now in the future plan that is supported by the community and backed up by data. We're going to explore all options. So you're going to hear everything from do nothing to completely reconfigure everything. So we're looking at all options. Solutions are driven by enrollment um, projections and pedagogy. And these last four, I'm just going to look like it slid right off the screen, um, are really driven by the visioning that we had um, with the staff and the leadership. And what they came forward with was increased efficiency
the last forum, you can either see them on the screen or you can see them here on the whiteboard. Um, but lots of great feedback as to what um, steps do we need to take to achieve these project goals. Um, I'll just take a couple of them to highlight. Um, communicate educational goals with the community and how the building supports them. So one of the big things we want to do is make sure that the facilities align with what the teachers and staff are trying to do from an educational standpoint as well as the students. Um, making sure that they have the opportunity to really practice those 21st century skills. Schools built a long time ago were more about classrooms and hallways. And you went to one classroom you learned one skill. And then the bell rang. And you went to the next classroom you learned another skill. Skill, sorry. That's not how we operate. We don't compartmentalize every skill and go on the next. We bring all these together. It's about collaboration, innovation. And so we need to make sure that now the schools support that way of thinking. And so we'll look for ways to incorporate that throughout the project as well. Um, to emphasize it even more, so we said think about the in-between spaces for socializing and learning from peers. Um, address um, elementary school program um, in equity. Reduce transitions. We understand different communities have more transitions than others. Being able to have similar transitions from grade levels. Um, making sure that maybe there's only one transition in elementary school instead of two. And, yeah, I'm not reading all of them. I'm just going to hit on a couple of them here. Um, a lot of advocacy for athletics, the arts, all the extracurricular activities that really make students well-rounded. It's about making whole students really provide them all of these opportunities. Um, and then the Learning Center, meet all kids where they're at and think about immediate needs. So I think over all of them, you can definitely see them here. They are um, uh, summarized um, in the PowerPoint, which well, we can send out if people like a copy of it. Um, the next opportunities for community engagement. So after <coughs> This evening's um, exercise, there is going to be more opportunities to participate in thought exchange. I know there's some conversations going on now about this on thought exchange. We'll continue that conversation over the summer. We've strategically placed this community forum before school gets out because we know what happens in the summer in Maine. Everybody wants to enjoy that weather we've waited so long for, and nobody has the capacity to attend community forums. And so we'll get back together in the fall and to what we've been doing all summer with all of our data collection and uh, different options that we're arriving at. Um, you see all the different things that we'll be doing this summer, um, and then we will get into um, really starting to look at draft options, and then we we'll review that with everyone, and then we we'll finalize that. And our plan is to wrap up by the, by the end of the year. So by the end of this calendar year, we'll be looking to wrap up. So I want to brainstorm the master plan options. I'm going to turn it over to Mike Perillo, who facilitated the conversation with the building uh, steering committee on some wonderful questions. Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Perillo. I'm an educational planner working with Maryland. I'm actually a former educator myself. I was a middle school teacher for almost 20 years. And then left the classroom really to help districts like yourselves make a bigger impact by really aligning teaching and learning in space. So that's some of the conversation that we had with district leadership when we started to do this work. Um, a few weeks ago, we met with district leadership members and we asked literally that question, what if? What if we did this? What if we did that? What if we combined schools? What if we consolidated this, these schools but let these schools open? What if we went to one giant elementary school? There really is no, at this point, best solution or right or wrong answer because as Lisa said in the beginning of this, we're still waiting to look at enrollment data, costs of things, all of those details. But just asking the general what ifs kind of helps to understand what are the possibilities, what is the potential, and then looking at some of the pros and cons and the impacts of each. So I'm going to give you a very high level overview of all the options we consider. We actually went into that meeting with about seven, six or seven options, and then left with uh, around 11, and very small iterations between some of those, with tweaks. 
that are given to us by leadership members. I'm going to go over that quick overview, and then as you go walking in, you probably saw there are posters starting all the way over there at the bleachers, and then wrapping around, and there's actually two more behind the screen. We're going to do the same exact exercise with you this evening, and ask you to give your thoughts and feedback. So these are the one considerations that we made. What if all portables were removed from all the schools? What would the impact be? Positive and negative. What about what if the number of schools remained as is? So every school remained online, but we did renovations to each. What if we and Lily and uh, Georgia Jack were consolidated to a new pre K to five school of around 500 students? An offshoot of that, you can see 2A was one that was added in when we were having a discussion. What if it would be Georgia Jack and Steve Falls were consolidated into a new 3K file? What if the district consolidated to three total 3K files? When you look at that, the three goals below number four shows you what those three schools might be. And again, nothing is set in stone, that might take a different shape. Number five, what if the district consolidated to two total pre K to fives? Meaning the entire district would only have two pre K to five schools. Plus, students stay online, approximately roughly around 500 students. And then that new elementary school would be nearly double that size with about 1,000 plus or minus students. These numbers, because again, we are still waiting to find out if we have enrollment projections and enrollment data. These numbers, I should say, are from the current enrollment. What if fifth grade moved to the middle school? What does that look like? Does it still follow? Do they still follow the same middle school model? Do they follow their own kind of pod? Do fifth and sixth kind of follow their own pod? And maybe seventh and eighth, and maybe that more upper middle school junior high type model. Number seven, what if the district distributed intensive special ed programs to kind of alleviate some of the you know, the burden in one school that doesn't necessarily need the tax basis to really support the needs of intensive programs. Eight, what about consolidating Hollis and uh, Emory and renovating the other elementary schools? What happens there? <coughs> what if we repurpose the existing, well, let me actually stop this here. Numbers eight, so the first grouping that I just read are the ones we essentially walked into that meeting. And having these deep conversations allowed us to start thinking, oh well, what happens if we do some other things? And so this this from 9 to 11 really started to create that. So now, what if uh, repurposing the existing middle school, bringing all the elementary populations into that school except for Buxton and leaving Buxton alive? We would build a new high school and we would repurpose the existing high school as the middle school. Number 10 is similar to that. Again, we're bringing all the existing elementary schools together, leaving Buxton as is. But the existing high school in number 10 becomes the home for adult ed and central offices, and then we build one combined middle high school, a 6 through 12 school. And again, there is no right or wrong answer to that either. What does that look like? In a lot of schools now where they have declining enrollment and all of their schools are really outdated, a number of schools, especially regional school districts, are going to that model where they may have one middle high school, but really they have two schools under one group. So you might have a separate entrance for the high school group, separate entrance for the middle school group, and they might share Know, the kitchen, but they might even have separate cafeterias or you know, other spaces like that. But it just allows more students to be impacted by changes. And then number 11 seems like, you know, why put it up there? But it is important to really think about it because it does have powerful impacts. What if we did absolutely nothing and left the buildings as is? What are the impacts to that? So when we Post all of these different scenarios to the group, we ask them to consider the what ifs with these two questions in mind. 
Because it's not as simple as like, this is a positive or this is a negative, because there's lots of gray areas in the middle of the room. So these are the two questions. How does the scenario address the medium and short-term educational facilities and needs of the district? And what are the educational, operational, and medium facilities and effects? A lot of those overarching goals, this desire for flexibility, to have more collaboration space, to allow you know, students and teachers to be able to take a breath during the day and kind of find space that allows them to you know, have a moment or collaborate with another person or kind of choose the space and experience they need. Do these options support those types of goals? This is what came out of the webs. So what is all for the support goals? The main conversation around that topic is, well then where do those kids and programs go? Because yes, maybe we don't prepare those four goals or replace the four goals because you know, that's expense, but do we have enough room in our schools to alleviate and improve those goals? What if the number of schools remains as it is with renovations to each school? Well, every school needs the ADA upgrades for accessibility. Extensive renovations and upgrades that need to be done. It doesn't support the whole board of your option. So operational costs are still going to be a challenge. It doesn't address staff and being split. That was actually a really powerful outcome when we had vision sessions early on, and the teachers were kind of talking about their experience. There are teachers in the district, and even administration in the district, that are literally being pulled and pushed into different buildings. And there's a lot of things I can tell you as an educator that happen in the day to day, like minute to minute of school. So that creates a big challenge because they're spread throughout all these schools. You'll see this concept of windshield time is expensive. That really means the hours people are driving to different locations. Not only the parents and students, but also the facility people. Traffic issues with facilities continue to exist. We've heard lots about that, especially at the end. And I should say, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because I'm really not into the city yet. I don't think you have really experienced this activity. You're going to see all of these same exact bullets on all the posters. So here's the thing that we can turn to Jack and consolidate. All the things in these two locations will be there. It does improve some student experiences. Some students are getting to experience the impacts of the new building. Which is not for parents, actually, though, may be better and may be worse than all their students are currently going. Efficiency of bus routes, essentially, and then there's some other kind of educational benefits. You want to pick up the dispersion of the programs and needs there. Adding to that group, see pause, and now consolidating those three buildings. Because you're combining some and not others, this is where some people might feel like they're being left out and they might feel different because that's not the typical community group that they're together with. Which could be a positive and powerful experience, but it also could be a challenge for some. Um, more students to receive a school that is intentionally designed for education, meaning the space is really exactly what they need. And it does improve the consistency of experience and instruction. So here's the option of consolidating the district's elementary schools to only three. Two things that came out of that conversation is all kids are going to be in the new, equally sized school. But some of you will end up, won't be letting end up using the community school. Two schools, two elementary schools total. The conversation was really a lot, you know, is that a, is that a not star? Is that absolutely is that crazy to think that all the elementary school kids would go to two schools? Is it too large, especially considering where they're coming from? Maybe we don't even have the right land or the right you know, location to support something like that. Fifth grade. Looking at fifth grade at an elementary school, or I'm sorry, at a middle school, fifth graders still play outside for recess. It, so the site and the of the middle school may not really support that. Is there even enough space to hold them? Now you're in fifth grade in the school, what do you do with the number of lunch waves? 
Are fifth graders more elementary than middle? Is there any really positive, powerful impact when you put fifth graders into a middle school model and there's this mentorship? I taught middle school before then fifth graders in the same building, and that too was a really powerful experience. What if you distributed intense and special ed programs? The new building project would have a dedicated special education space for those with intensive programs. But if you start to disperse special education programs to alleviate some of the challenges of buildings, now you have staff that are only supporting one program, let's say a life skills program, and now they're not with colleagues anymore and they kind of become isolated. Your turn. So again, as I said, all of the content, plus some of the bullets that it really cover, are on all of the posters around the, uh, the gym. You can come up to the table in just a second. You can grab a bag of uh, post-it notes, just take a few. There's pins in those buckets you also can grab. Write on the post-it notes. Each post-it note should really have each individual thought or reaction or piece of feedback. And remember those same questions. What are the educational impacts? What are the pros? What are the cons? And is it really meeting some of these goals that we're talking about? No answer is right or wrong. I remember that. This is really just your gut reaction and your thinking because you're the ones that live in these buildings and in cars and in communities all the time. So you really get the pulse and know. Any questions before we start? Okay, so is that the end of your time? So let's shoot for about 15 minutes to give you time, and we'll obviously be around if you have questions or thoughts. But please feel free to get up, fill out as many thoughts as you can, and we'll check in. Thank you all for participating in that activity and for all the feedback. I love the fact that there are so many post notes. And I think one of the really exciting things is the fact that, you know, walking around, I see young kids standing next to adults also putting post notes now. So I think that's amazing. I think that says a lot about the community. So thank you. I appreciate the kids being involved as well because they're the ones that will be impacted by these decisions, right? So that's great. So I probably shouldn't have told you to sit because I'm actually going to have you stand back up. But you know, it's, it's exercise. It keeps you awake. Right, exactly. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to ask that you go back to the posters. I'm going to ask that about three people stand around one poster. You can stand with friends or neighbors or completely mix yourselves up with strangers because that might help with the feedback. There's some directions up here on the screen. So once you're at the station, and again, there's about three, some of you, there's 11 posters, so about three to four people per poster would be great. We want you to look at the post-it notes on each of the posters, or the, I'm sorry, the poster that you're standing at. And when you look at the posters, you're gonna to start to probably see some like, you know, outlier statements, and then some statements that are probably very similar and build on one another. Take the post notes and group them together as best as you can with like ideas together. And then have somebody prepare to report out from the group because we're going to do a whip around the gym to just get the, the one big takeaway from that poster. 
Maybe there's two crazy, you know, complete polar opposite thoughts at that poster. That's fine as well. You can have two overarching statements as well. Please know we will be documenting every single comment, every single post note, but this just gives us a good summary, a wrap up of kind of where the pulse of the group is. Okay? Questions about that? If on your way, on your way up, if you have not signed um, the sign-in sheet, please come and do so and return any pins and post them back up and head over to a post We'll give you about, um, let's start with 10 minutes. So at 7.05, we will regroup. And again, one person should be prepared to share. All right, we are going to start reporting out. So the one person that is at the... Do we have one person ready to report out at each station? Thumbs up if you are ready to report out at each station. One person? All right. So let's start over here. Can I get everybody's attention? So we have a question, what if the district does nothing? And the consensus across the board is it's not an option. Why was it not an option? Well, we're just some, some of the reasons where the buildings are crumbling, it's going to require too much to, to maintain and to repair. Possibility staff may be because of inadequate facilities. Um, on the positive side, the district needs to grow with the town's growth, and being proactive is the smart way to go. Great, thank you. Okay, the next poster. I, I appreciate how you said we had X poster, and this was the content, so everybody gets oriented. Hi, I'm going to get some help here. Uh, so with, the first thing I noticed on this one is that there are three different points here, so it gets a little messy when we're trying to separate them out. So and you have the one that's the one campus option. One campus option. Yes. yes. Okay. So there are um, some comments about <coughs> that very positive, especially with the 6 to 12 with the social skills that would be developed and um, more of a central feel to it. Uh, and then we have some that are more concerned with lots of money, um, need a lot of land, and how to pay for it, basically. Uh, then we had some that were, this is a little more difficult for me, uh, focused on if the high school would be, it would be too big for the community, uh, and if it would also be too big for the adult ed and central office, since they already have, um, well, basically, it, it was just too large for those um, adult ed and central offices if they would be utilizing the space. And then uh, also in Relation to the bucks in remaining um, by itself, a lot of people were concerned about that it would feel left out or somehow less. And let's see, the last one is uh, basically this is just too big. I mean, a lot of people are just saying it just seems way too big, too big of a project. Very important to There are just very polar opposite opinions on here. One of them that says, we love the idea of a central community, school community, and one that says, this is way too big for us. So it's very polar opposite opinions in there. I think there are some small points that will be made here about the existing high school and the repurposing of that to uh, become the adult ed in central offices. It's just maybe too big for that repurposing, but it's just an idea within the campus, of course. Thank you.
I just wanted to expand on that. I don't think that I captured the notes, but when we talked about that, um, it really, this building would become everything else that doesn't fit in the other buildings. Which makes more sense, right? It might be a pre-K center, it might be all our alternative learning, it wouldn't just be those two functions. And the other thing would be something like this space, that this gym would stay used by everyone, right? Some of the spaces would be, continue to be used by the rest of the campus. So, absolutely, that, I actually agree that just for those two functions, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, if we went with something like that, it would be so much more than that. It would be literally everything else that doesn't fit. One other option as well might be to allow for this central space, this portion of it, to be Not just for athletics, but other uses too. So maybe you don't need the expanded town hall, the expanded town hall, the halls, etc. Thank you. Hey, the next group. Hi. So ours was very similar in theme to combine that, except for it's repurposing the existing middle school um, to be one big elementary school, but leaving by the center the way it should be, or the way it is. Same theme as existed over there is that many people felt that that would be isolating Buxton Center while every other school in the community was together on this campus. Um, but that same opposite theme was it would be one community, one place, equality for education, um, better for the special ed department, and any of those people that are driving from place to place would also have that one central location. Um, traffic was a big concern, so busing and traffic so tended to be a theme that everyone felt that if we combine everything here, it would just exacerbate what is already a problem in this district, if you've ever been here about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so that was a concern. The big, the third area was basically if we built a new high school, where would it be, what would it look like, how close would it be to the existing, or what you used. This school becomes a middle school, so then where is the high school? Can they get to and from sharing the track and the fields and everything like that? Right now, the middle school and the high school can share some of those things, but if you build a high school off-site, are you then also having high schoolers drive to the athletic fields or middle schoolers have to get from point A to point B, if that makes sense at all? There was just one point um, that I thought was really good on here. It says kids will adapt to anything. Um, and I think there was a sticky note on one of the others that said parents are going to hate it, kids are going to be fine with it. So I think that's something uh, definitely to consider. So we had the what if all portables were removed, and mostly people thought were concerned with the safety that uh, it should be safe. <laughs> and that the, where would the kids go? We would need more facilities and to make whole other schools or buildings to add on to previous buildings, which would obviously cost a lot. And that the, the whole like, school community would be kind of spread out for uh, portables and not just grouped in one school. Thank you. Okay, so ours was, what if the number of schools remain as is with renovations to each school? And overall, people were saying that that's just a short-term solution, which could end up being more expensive and doesn't necessarily fix a lot of the issues. Um, but there were also a lot of comments that keep, keeping the schools would um, keep the local community feel and people would be more comfortable keeping their schools in their community as is. So. Both of those sides. All right. So this one's what if Edna, Lydia, and Georgie Jack were combined um, to a pre-K through five, which about 500 plus, and we just arranged it in positive and negatives, and there looks to be about the same for both. Um, a couple negatives were that um, some of the students would feel like they're not meeting other kids, and it would be the same kids that they'd be exposed to K through five, but then other people said that that's actually building good relationships um, 
so bad or good, and they both um, did say less bus time. The traffic, again, would need to be addressed um, at Edna, and it, it looks like it's a little bit of both, I guess. So. <clears throat> This poster was in regards to what Edna, George, and Jack, and Seat Falls all combined into a new K-5 school. Um, a lot of the comments mentioned uh, better access to resources, improved uh, communication with staff, um, extracurricular activities, uh, better options for extracurricular activities for the kiddos. Um, some of the negatives were that it would be an inequity for Lumington and Hollis schools. Um, and some of the neutral comments were, how about we build Bonnie Eagle schools, not Buxton Hollis Spanish, which I thought was pretty awesome as far as I thought. So we had uh, consolidated into three elementary schools with Spanish having one consolidated with Buxton Spanish Mind. So we have um, there's some positive, lot of positive comments about this will be um, equitable, that everybody gets a new modern elementary school, that everyone has some more consistent uh, programs. Um, so definitely some positivity around that. There's some concerns about schools um, on kids. Um, so saying this is where fifth grade will moved over, um, what these schools look like after numbers, and then we have some other concerns about um, community, right, the falls and the lake not having the schools, like what happens, who gets to the building, who gets picked, um, and then just concerns about the costs um, to the towns, because each individual town pays for their facilities, how does, how does that break down for the taxes, and then just in general. And did you just say what a fifth grade does? No, it's like someone's out there, fifth grade moves, then they're not with this. majority of 
the serving team we did around the staff. One of the things was is that um, if we isolate practitioners, it won't help the staff retention. Specifically, there's a couple notes about if you spread out services, they will be, um, let's say, there's too many components for special ed, meaning um, social worker, speech, OT, PT, special ed interactions. So the stress might in the sense, impact the staff, as well as it, and it have staffing issues to now allow to support the programs as distributed. Um, the other concern, of course, is travel and transportation. If, if they are distributed around, we are kind of busting some of our most difficult students or students that have uh, special needs to different places versus being essentially, you know, these buses going, okay, we're going to have three kids in one location. And the last one is about the fact that uh, the money and the finances, because if you distribute things, some of the buildings don't have the special education, um, let's say, facilities that Boston does. So it's like, to be very equal, we have to spend a lot of money on some of these other locations to get them up to the same thing. Uh, we had, um, what if we were to consolidate Hollis and H.B. Emory and renovate the other elementary schools? Generally, one of the big concerns was that um, if we were to just consolidate Hollis and H.B. Emory, extended schools would be left out. Uh, some of them would have um, experienced different uh, schooling than the ones in the Hollis Elementary and H.B. Emory consolidation. Um, we also had concerns about uh, one was won't solve the inefficient speed falls problem, um, doesn't solve the transportation and tra transition issues in the speed falls, and there's a lot of speed falls stuff. Um, we also had some more, uh, some other opinions that in general they think that consolidation is good. Um, they have one was Hollis isn't big enough. Um, some, this one was if there's a consolidation that's going to occur, Hollis would be the first, Hollis and H.P. Emory would be the first choice. And then we also had an outlier opinion that um, consolidated schools in general would, could be an issue of creating large classes and more craziness among the students. I think the general um, idea was that Consolidation is good, just maybe not with just halls in here. Yeah. All right, if everybody has a seat, and then we will move on to the next step. Center, even as a new school, 
this year we're having to relocate two programs not just because we want to do it, but because we're running out of room in that school for special ed programs, because there are so many programs. So we're, we're moving those to some of the outlying schools. We're adding pre-K. Um, you know, we added two classrooms. We would love to have universal pre-K. Right now, I don't know where we would put more pre-K classrooms if we did that. Um, so in that way, we're kind of running out of space, even though our enrollments might not show that we have too many kids, if that makes sense. Um, the other point I wanted to make is about cost. I'm very interested to understand like whatever options we arrive at, whatever those might be, what are the costs? Because some of these are going to make us look really favorable for state support, uh, for a state-funded project, which might get us high on that list of 74. Others aren't. So some of these would be 100% locally funded and more by the taxpayers. Um, one of the questions was, do towns pay for their own schools? And as an SED, it doesn't work that way. The whole district shares the cost, no matter where the school is built, right? And I've seen that play out over the last 20 years, right? Buxton was a, it was a group effort, the whole district voted. There was a project in Paulus that got voted down before I became principal there. I lived in Spanish at the time and got mailers asking me to vote against that project, right? So we have got into these battles. So one of my goals in this process is to not get communities against each other. One by one, that, that comment came, made up. The, the, the idea of not thinking about it as the different towns, but then we're all one people. So that, that's something that's a goal of mine through this process. And the last thing is traffic. That's easy when I don't need to look at that. <laughs> all I have to say is yes, 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 double yes. Whatever might be done, wherever, whichever poster it is, we must, for the camera, we must address the traffic problems. It doesn't matter what site, there's middle school, high school, Hollis, Edmund Libby, Georgia Jack, HBM. If you've ever been at HBM in bus time, thank goodness that road is not well traveled. Because if there was a lot of traffic on it, they're blocking that road too. Steep falls might be not so much, but on some days probably also they're out on the road. We have traffic problems at all our sites, and no matter what we do, we need to address the traffic problems. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone knows that that is high on our list for whatever project we choose. I don't really want to have to follow that, but thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm sure as you were having those conversations, and I love the fact that you were that involved in them, and I appreciate that truly, genuinely. Um, I know some people have additional ideas and scenarios of what ifs. So if you have one, feel free, and you want to share it, please raise your hand, and I'll give you the mic. It's not really So just in retrospect, or actually looking at the isolation of Buxton Center Elementary School, when we were talking about our post-it notes, which was the middle school coming to the high school, high school being brand new, and all the other the elementary schools combining, the Buxton Center was still isolated. Why wasn't Buxton Center, who you're saying is still running out of space for different things, why isn't that central office and adult ed and things like that, and then you still combine the elementary school I think this is exactly what we're passing the mic around because the group think is better than any one or a group of people. Because honestly, that idea, it sounds great to me now that you say it because I hadn't occurred to me to think of it that way. So I think that's an example of the kind of thing we're hoping to get from people at these meetings. So thank you, and I'm sure the notes are being taken. See, no, don't say the word.
a lovely facility at a middle school, and their, um, their fifth grade there is in the, in the middle school, but they have their own wing. And so that separates them to a certain extent um, and helps them make the transition into um, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade where things will go well. But that, it seems to be working. Fifth grade had their own kind of way of pod in the learning community is actually a very common practice now in, in contemporary buildings. You sometimes you have a fifth grade academy or an eighth grade academy, or five and six together as a hub, and seven and eight together as a hub. So great, thank you. Anybody else have another scenario they want to go out? This isn't really another scenario, it would be an add-on to any one of these, but what I didn't see addressed was for new athletic facilities, um, whether that's already pre-planned and not specifically specified there. But I think this community uh, has outdated facilities and the future is a turf field if you look across the state, look across the country of where it's going. Um, not only would a turf field because of its utilization in the fall of fall sports or the spring of spring sports, that would be an updated sense of product for our students, but also a draw and hub for our community. Be prized on the board, on the board from the last meeting that parents, grandparents, students could all be proud to come to the new facility. Plus, fields like that have a fairly large sunk cost to get them up and running, but you don't have the continued maintenance costs that you have to do and not keep on the field if it gets tore up throughout the season. And I'm sure you won't pay the field every single time for various sports and changing those uh, and the durability on those fields uh, are very high now compared to what they used to be about that year ago. But I think it's worthy to consider rolling the bass into Yes, and just to, just to speak to that a little bit, this was fairly focused just on actual buildings, but in our greater conversations and at the last meeting, it definitely came up. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of, and again, I'm not trying to push towards any one scenario or the other, but some of the larger scale projects would allow us to look at things like our field space, our parking on one site, whereas if we start parsing things off in the smaller projects, they might be a little more local cost. But it's definitely something that's coming to loud and clear, not only for the turf field and athletics, but performing arts spaces. We have a couple of gentlemen here tonight who are talented musicians, have performed, have won awards, traveled all over, and have performed in an inadequate space the whole time in high school, right? Like, our football team wins championships and work out the weight room the size of a closet, right? So, there are so many examples of what you're saying that we, it's on our, definitely on our radar. Um, and how do we how do we try to do as much as we can and be responsible with, with the community's sort of tax base? So one of the things that some of the scenarios here would fit some of the concerns that I have, and some wouldn't. I think when we think about like, attracting staff, keeping faculty and staff here, um, we have to balance up the needs of the various communities with the enormity of some of the changes here. I think that some of the amenities that we would be able to offer in some of these choices, I'm thinking specifically like offering daycare for faculty and staff children. So when we're thinking about those kind of balances, I think it's really important that we also think about how that goes into bringing the kind of faculty and staff that we want, keeping the kinds of faculty and staff that we want, knowing that a couple of these would require people to maybe, as we talked about, go further. Travel, transportation is a big concern. It's a big driver of people seeking other uh, districts to work in. So I think, I don't know that there's, I don't have a solution. I think that's one of the definite, definite important uh, factors that we need to take into account when we're, when we're really finalizing one or two or three of these options. 
Anybody? So I know this is probably more of a standard planning board type of thing, or whichever town. But these projections, I guess we're going to get like the data in about a month or so. Um, that's going to that's a projection for ten years. Is that like what we're thinking? Um, yes, it's, I mean it's a long range planning. I think they try to project that ten years. Obviously, it's a challenge to be precise on that. But we're, we have somebody who this is what they do, who is giving us that, that data, so we're, we need to trust that that's going to be as accurate as it could be, but yes, long, long term. Okay. Um, is that right now, is there ever a town that you foresee in the next 10 years pulling off and being able to save a school system on their own? That's, I know it's really complicated. Yeah, it is. Is, I, in, is, is in Bucks and Annan Spanish, but. I'll speak to it briefly. I, I, I will claim to have all the information on this. It's, I know this is not to be dangerous, probably. <laughs> okay. It, it gets very complicated because because we are an SAD, there has to be sort of formal procedures to, to dissolve that or for a town to kind of succeed, right? Because our, our tax base and our funding is all is all tied together, there's a some ground that wants to happen for one town to leave. And then you might say, okay, let's say it's Standish. Well, there's schools in Standish. Well, the, the schools aren't necessarily owned by the town, so then there's the complication of, is the town only the school? Does the school district have it? Who gets the high school? It's in Standish, right? So then what does everyone else do? It's, it's a lot, and I, and I think the reason, you know, S86 was one of the first schools to consolidate back before it was, it was pushed by um, the state in more recent times, is people saw the financial advantages of pooling the resources. Um, so we were one of the first S SADs in the state, and then we were at a point where when the, when the state in the more recent times started to really encourage consolidation, I think it was under Governor LePage, that was really a big point for him. We didn't have any further to consolidate. Us, us wrapping in Dayton or Gorham or whatever didn't even make sense because we were already such a big district. So that actually helped us. So to, to go back on that, what I've seen is a lot of communities that have tried to do those things, they run into problems and so often they end up coming back together. So it's not something that I would necessarily recommend, but if, if a community wanted to do that, there would be quite a few steps. Anybody else have any other scenarios or additions or suggestions? Um, so I'm a pediatric physical therapist. That's what I do for real. I'm a coach here. Um, but one complaint that I do get where most of our um, individuals who need special education is that if you live on the window side of Spanish, your child is on a bus for almost an hour. They're getting on the bus at quarter of seven and they're five years old. Um, it's a long time. So, right, so they have to go. And then if you have a child who doesn't require the same type of instruction, they actually are going to either Edmund or Georgia Jack or Steve Falls. So when you're talking about consolidating, you're also helping some families that different needs are met in different places. Um, if special education or all of our education was centralized between the districts, that everyone has an equal distance to pretty much travel as opposed to people traveling from one end to another. So that's something to consider. The other thing is I heard a lot, um, if schools get big, class sizes get big, and I totally disagree with that. I'm from Providence for Island, and I can tell you all of my schools that I ever attended were way bigger than this, and my class size was never bigger than like 22. So it can be done to have bigger schools or bigger campuses, but your instruction and your teachers are collaborating. Um, the opportunities that you have are so much more as either an educator or as a student within the system. So that's just my take as far as big schools. Thank you. So I feel like you're a plan to make it. Because one of the things that you just said, I, I was going to circle back to you, but I just didn't want to let people talk first. Um, as long as I am in charge here, we, uh, a, a school with a thousand kids would not feel like a school with a thousand kids. There are ways to do that, that you could have one roof, and you could divide that up so it would feel exactly the feeling that you get in a community school. It would just be one heat source, one water bill, one electric bill, one set of services, but in that school, there could be a separate office, a separate principal. 
that you go to for your three pot of 300 kids or 250 kids or whatever it is. And that would be more what I would be thinking if we went down the road of that, is to make it feel small so kids get that individual attention. Um, and the first part, remind me, what did you say the first part? Again? Especially, yes. Amen to that, because that is one of the challenges of having the design of Buxton when we opened it was, was solid, the idea behind it. But we're having these issues now, these growing pains with transportation and not meeting everyone's needs. And I, I made a lot of calls today with some of the Steve Falls parents um, who were talking about trying to reel them back into Steve Falls. And I learned a lot from talking to these folks. And one of them was that one, one mom said, I got three kids in three schools, so honestly, if I could put my kids in one school, that would be great with me, and they weren't really worried about um, you know, what school it was, because it just simplifies their life. So that's a great point, it's something that we're also taking into consideration when we put all of these plans. So, thank you. Okay, anybody else before we move on? Okay, Stacey, you want to talk next steps? I just want to emphasize something that Clay said. You definitely can make a large school small feel small. They're called schools within a school. Communities do them all over the place. And it really is thinking about how do you create that smaller community within the larger community and how do you keep breaking down that community so that those students don't feel the size of the school. And it's reinforced with great staff and really building that community. So next steps. Um, a lot of these next steps we kind of saw on the previous slides, but the part that I really want to emphasize is that we want to continue to build off this conversation. This has been wonderful. Um, we're really impressed with the thoughtfulness, watching everybody stand in front of these posters and really think about what they're going to write and put on these posters and what we're hearing from everyone. It really helps all of us as we go down this road to finish collecting the data, analyzing it, and coming back with draft options to uh, share with everyone. So, when everyone takes summer off, <laughs> give us some feedback through thought exchange, but check back in right after the school year starts. That's when we'll start having forums again um, to bring people up to speed as to all of the data we've been able to collect with the schools empty. We'll bring our team of architects and engineers through the buildings. We'll finish all of our programming. And um, again, we'll come forward with draft options, then we'll do refined options, and then we'll prepare the final report. So please keep, um, keep a lookout for any of those dates as we get uh, um, back from summer. Anything else on the next steps, Paul? On the thought exchange, I, what I'll probably do is let the current thought exchange sort of end. I had a set to end this, I think this Friday. I can leave it open until the end of the month. But I think what I would do is launch a new exchange that's more focused on this discussion. So we can kind of have a new, because uh, it can get a little confused or even the algorithm when you, when you start switching things up in the middle, right? So I think what you would do is just look for a new thought exchange coming out in the summer and into the fall, specifically to comment on some of what we talked about tonight. Perfect. Thanks. That'd be great. So we can build off this conversation with the broader community. So thank you. It's been wonderful.